you so much for being with us tonight. Um, it's a film that raises a lot of questions, I think, and so it's great to be able to have a conversation with you after, immediately after showing it. Um, I guess to start off, in your introduction, you mentioned uh, sort of a, uh, made, made a statement about the fact that this is a work of fiction, but it was all entirely drawn from these testimonies uh, of real women, real people who lived these events and these experiences. And um, I wonder if just to start, you could talk about how you came to these stories and to this story and how this, um, in sort of a big picture way, how the film came together and uh, what, what drew you to these stories. And it's a very small question. <laughs> um, so the first time I, I heard about these women fighters was uh, August 31st, 2015. I was reading the newspapers and I, there were a few articles about them. And I, I had been aware of uh, the Yezidi women who had been you know, uh, kidnapped by ISIS, but I was not aware of the women who escaped and then became fighters. And that, um, that paradigm shift, you know, that, that, uh, that change of perspective you know, from depicting women as victims to depicting women as resistance um, I feel we've always been aware of that as women, but it's hardly ever represented on screen. And I think um, we need that as women. You know, it, it, it sort of, you know, it, I don't know, it lit something in me and it really filled me with a lot of intensity and, and desire to know more and to convey the story. And I just realized that if it moved me that much in one paragraph, it could be very powerful in a movie. Um, and then I started doing some research. Um, my producer, who was uh, born in Iran, was a refugee. She fled when she was eight years old. Obviously, that spoke to her a lot, you know. Um, and we went to Kurdistan together. We interviewed the women. And uh, we realized that, you know, there was something very sacred about what was happening, in the sense that they had been through so much hell and yet they were standing in front of us because they knew it was important for them, for all women, you know, uh, to convey the stories and to, to pass it on. And um, so, you know, we, we sort of collected all the stories that we could and we met as many people as we could. And the, uh, the most important task was to try to honor, you know, the trust that they had placed in us and to uh, make sure that we're not ever imposing some sort of uh, westernized vision onto what was happening, but to depart from where they were starting. And uh, could you talk a bit more about the research process and the, um, I, obviously this is a film that would require a great deal of uh, sort of immersion in mm. this life and this this environment, and what? Uh, how did how did that process go? Um, well, I, I traveled quite a lot. You know, I, I went to see uh, the women where they were in Germany, in France. The, a few of them were in France and in Kurdistan, and uh, it was it was a balance between trying to understand real life stories, trying to understand the culture. So uh, I have a very academic background. So you know, I read a lot of books about the Yazidi culture. I we we reached out to uh, a lot of consultants, uh, cultural consultants, to make sure that you know we're not um, doing th silly things and to make sure that it made sense within the Kurdish culture and the Yazidi cu culture to talk about things in, in a way or another. For example, something very simple. Uh, the Yazidi people, for them, the, the blue color is a color that you can't wear, so could not dress. Yazidi people with blue, simple things that you, you can't know, you know, if you don't um, do that work. And uh, on, on set, I always had two consultants. Uh, one who had been uh, a guerrilla fighter with the, the, the Kurdish people. And another one, you know, for the language and, and the culture and always making sure that all the, the wardrobe and, and the, uh, whenever we improvise that it, it made sense. 
um, and it was a matter of like you know just checking everything all the time at each uh, part of the process and after that to trust filmmaking also because it's a movie and pretty sure you know a few details you know uh, went through the cracks but I I was always aware that what was important was the um, the story of the women, and that that was our you know guiding sun uh, throughout the the process of the the shooting and, and the preparation. Uh, in, in that, oh, sorry, and and I I want to add something because people don't know something about writing and research, but you know you never you never leave such an adventure without being physically touched and you know I think for example when you write a comedy you know you have a lot of good times and you're filled with good energy and when you go through such testimonies um, it's it can can lead to very strange situations at some point in the writing process you know I was covered in eczema and, and things like that because you've seen the movie like the, the stories that are told are not stories that we know, um, most of us know in the Western world, we have not lived war. And there are memories from our grandparents or our, the, the generation of our parents, but it seems so far away. And I just wanted to convey the fact that it was also happening right here, right now, and not far away. And Right after we decided to uh, to make that movie, you know, there were the terrorist attacks in Paris, and suddenly I had friends, good friends, who uh, got bullets in the chests, and who were basically touched the same way these women had been, um, and and all all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you know, it started to make sense how everything was linked and everything, you know, we live in a world where the, the walls are not um, um, waterproof anymore, you know, the impacts, you know, that, that the war situations over there have over here are very important. It's um, what you've just described, I think, speaks to one of the most unusual aspects of this film, which is that it sort of synthesizes this um, structure and form of the, a classical war movie, sort of on an epic scale and, and a very beautiful treatment of the landscape. And, um, and at the same time, it feels very immediate. And very, it's a story that hasn't been told of these women fighters and the very um, sort of visceral way in which they have come to this life of being fighters. And I wonder how you sort of straddled that line of, of telling a very classical narrative while also telling a story that's very up to the minute and very much still unfolding in the world right this second and is it's immediate. Although it's very scary, the fact that it was so close to us um, because I, I never knew how things were going to unfold. You know, when I started the story, ISIS was at its height. And I started wondering very basic questions, you know, am I safe? Is my family safe? You know, is my child gonna be safe when the movie gets released? And um, I had heard that there was another movie about ISIS that had been released a couple of years before, and I heard that the um, ISIS had, I um, mean, you know, extremists had sort of threatened movie theaters to, with attacks uh, at the time, and. You know, it's just a very fine line of trying to be cautious and at the same time just taking the stand and, and, and not backing down. And uh, thankfully, you know, things calm down a lot. Um, but to go back to the, uh, the beauty of the landscape and, and, and the imagery, I think people who fight a war, uh, they, strive, they strive for life. They want to remain alive. It's not about death, you know. It ends up being about death, but at the, at, you know, at the beginning of it all, it's about fighting for your life. And all the testimonies I had, and what I could witness, you know, uh, when I talked to people and when I watched documentaries about the whole thing, was that um, the Kurdish culture is very lively. They have 
a great sense of humor. They use colors a lot, you know, in the scarves. That, that's the, the scarf that belongs to Lamia in the movie, and I sort of keep it, you know, as a, as a memory of the shoot. But um, it sort of made sense to me to steer away from the traditional Second World War movie with, you know, monochrome, a monochrome treatment, because that's not what I saw. And I wanted to get back to the roots of what I could witness that war was in 2000 and, you know, when we made the movie 17, and not what years and years of filmmaking about war had taught me. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, the narrative is classical because I felt that it was so powerful anyway, there was no need to sort of become really fancy in the narrative, just straight story with very concrete anecdotes and, and, and journeys, you know, from the characters would be enough. That uh, raises another question, um, which is that I think another um, sort of stroke of genius in the film is that it's, uh, the narrative opens up to us through a war correspondent, through a Western war correspondent who's embedded with these fighters and uh, is sort of discovering this story as it's unfolding on the camera. And uh, was that, um, can you talk about the choice to sort of use that as a vehicle for opening up the story? Because obviously it doesn't, this, it, the film is not her, uh, Mathilde's story. The, it's the story of this group of women of which she becomes a part, but as an observer in sort of a similar way to the way uh, the audience is observing and um, the camera is observing. And what were your thoughts on sort of that technique? Um, well, to start with, you know, filmmaking is an industry. Um, and I quickly realized like really early on in the process that if I didn't have any French in the film, I would never get it financed. You know, you just gotta be practical when you're a filmmaker sometimes. So I was like, oh shit, you know, like who can speak French in fucking Kurdistan? And <laughs> no one, hey, journalist. Um, so I started doing some research about that and I got very lucky because I met this incredible guy, uh, Xavier Moons, who made a documentary that is exceptional called um, uh, Encerclé par l'État islamique. Uh, sorry, I don't have the, the title in English. And he basically stayed three weeks uh, trapped in Sinjar, the, the, the town I'm referring to in the movie, with the Kurdish fighters. And he documented everything. And it's insane. Like, you watch the documentary. And, and, and I got to meet him. And he's such this lively character, just very full of contradictions, you know, talking to me about his kids and how his kids would call him and he would just have bombarding <laughs> next to him and on Christmas Day, you know, like on, on the verge of dying and, and wishing Merry Christmas to his children. And it's their lives and they are so important and especially even more nowadays where you have such um, an overwhelming amount of information. But they're the ones who take the risks. And they, they don't get the recognition they deserve. They don't get you know, the, the money they should get f to, to do what they, they're doing because um, you know, a lot of them actually start out with their own projects, put in their own money because they believe in the necessity of uh, conveying the information. And uh, I read a lot about female war reporters, Martha Gellhorn, who's an amazing, uh, legendary figure of war reporting. She started in 1936 in Spain. And you can still read her texts, um, the ones she wrote about the Spanish Civil War and, and the Second World War, because they're still relevant. They still talk about our society today. And I think that's the genius of those people. They, they manage to see w you know, the essence and, and the, the universality Universalism, universalism, sorry, of, of those moments, and they're completely essential to the stories. And I don't think there's any conflict, major conflict at the moment, that doesn't have them. So to pretend talking about these conflicts, you know, completely neglecting them, neglecting them is is um, is actually a mistake. And I and I didn't even know that at the beginning. I just realized that it was actually the right path. So I felt very. Uh, 
very lucky that you know I had to make a, <laughs> a French journalist and put her in in the movie, and of course you know I wanted a woman, um, because I could not believe the amount of uh, women war reporters that I was stumbling upon when I was doing my research, and and they're not represented, and so you tend to think that they don't exist and that they don't do the job, but they're they're insanely brave and and interesting and. Uh, so that, that was very important. Well, I, uh, I have more to ask, but I will open it up to the audience. I know we have a microphone that will be coming around, so um, let's start right there. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions. One is um, the eye patch and allusion to Marie Colvin. And did you always have a flashback structure when you were writing the script, or was it chronological and you decided to start with uh, the beginning and go back to the very same shot at the end? Yeah, you're right. Actually, I forgot to talk about Mary Colvin. I, I forgot it um, mid-sentence. Um, uh, Mary Colvin was obviously a, a big influence on, on her character um, for two things, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, she's the one who revealed to the world that uh, Bashar al-Assad was doing what he was doing, and she paid with her life. She actually died in 2012 in Homs. And you know, the scene where she tells that story is a wishful thinking scene where she tells that she survived, but she did not. Um, and I studied her a lot in documentaries and the way she spoke and, and the energy that this woman had. You know, she loved life. She was a very intense woman a lot of contradictions, um, had issues with alcohol and everything, and I sort of took that, you know, to talk about the frailty of these um, characters who risk their lives and at the same time they're completely hooked on adre adrenaline. You know, it's a very vicious circle. And yet, you know, they don't hesitate to go for it and, and you know, they're at the forefront of, of everything that, uh, that happens, so they show extreme bravery. Um, and uh, the second part of the question was, uh, sorry, flashback. flashback yes, um, the the final structure is extremely close to the writing structure. Um, we maybe removed a couple of scenes, uh, but I always had the flashback scene because in my in my mind, I just felt that there was no way we could relate to the emotional state of Bahar, the main character, if we didn't know what she had gone through. And I felt it was much more interesting to discover the scope of what she had gone through throughout the movie, instead of sort of dumping that chronologically, like first part, second part. Um, and, and I tried you know, to insert these moments, uh, the flashbacks, every time so that we could understand more of what was happening in the present. Um, and you know, I, get, I guess I'm a, I'm a sucker for novels, uh, and you know, I have a very liter literary background, and um, I love that. Yes, right here. Thank you. Uh, I have a comment and a question. While uh, I was watching the film, I was thinking about the Spanish Civil War and the various uh, documentaries or films that I see in my attempt to understand what went on long before I was born. And I'm sure that people will be watching this film 50 years from now trying to understand what the Kurds were and the Yazidis were going through because it's uh, fairly confusing for somebody who's not from that area. The other thing I wanted to say is that I realized just from my uh, keeping up with world news that one of the major problems that the Kurds face at this point is the reluctance and resistance of uh, Turkish President Erdogan to their having their own state. But I noticed in the credits of your film that there was one Erdogan who was credited for participation in the film. Uh, you're, uh, you have no, con you, this person Erdogan it's it's not in my thanks. I don't I don't even remember. Uh, but believe me, it has no. <laughs> link well, whatsoever. anyway, it's a hopeful <laughs> idea because obviously yeah. he wasn't afraid to participate. Anyway, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, well, you know, it's interesting what you mentioned about the Spanish Civil War because 
that's the reason why I made the movie. My grandfather was a soldier in the Spanish Civil War. I'm half Spanish. And he enrolled when he was 16. Um, and I always grew up with stories about, you know, um, resistance, failure, uh, idealism, to fight for, for democracy. My family crossed the Pyrenees, um, you know, landed in a refugee camp. So all of this is part of m my personal myth mythology. And when I came across the story of the Kurdish people, and you know, the more I researched, the more I realized that it echoed in so many ways with what I knew and what I had researched personally, because I had, I had wanted to do a, a project about the Spanish Civil War, unfortunately, I was very much aware, in, it was, that was in 2007, that as a first time filmmaker, and at that time, nobody gave a shit. So, um, so I sort of you know, um, dropped that idea, but when I came across the Kurdish struggle, I just realized all the parallels. And if you talk to war reporters, they will tell you that the um, similarities between the um, the explosion of the Spanish Civil War as, as a prologue to the Second World War is extremely similar to what's happening in the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, and what might happen. Uh, many people are very worried. I think we tend to be caught up in our own local news cycles, but you know, things are not going well. Erdogan, um, Putin, and Bashar al-Assad are you know, getting more and more power by the day. Um, Europe and the States are completely abandoning the Kurds. Uh, what has happened in the past few months is disgusting, to, to be honest. Um, they're, the, they're the only reason why ISIS didn't win. If they had not fought, we would have ISIS all over the place. And they got completely left out of all the conversations, all the discussions. And right now, you know, they're being uh, more and more circles, you know, circled by, by you know, between the, the Syrian forces and the Turkish forces, you know, it, it's getting more and more um, desperate by the day. So, um, and it's exactly what happened with uh, the, the, uh, the Spanish soldiers from the Spanish Republic, you know, they got dumped by everyone while you know, um, everyone else was getting weapons and, and you know, uh, Russia, Russia and Europe were rehearsing the Second World War in terms of weaponry and strategies in Spain. And I think a lot of it ha is happening over there right now. Yeah, I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, yes, right there. Thank you for the film. Thank you. Uh, I th thought I saw it at the end credit that you wrote the script in consultation with someone else. Could you talk about that? Um, Jacques Aktoshi is um, a, cons a, a script, what we call a script consultant, and he's uh, he's the type of person when you bang your head against the wall in your <laughs> little writing office, not knowing what the fuck you're doing anymore, and he comes in and he's like, you know, are you? really sure that you want to keep, you know, those like 10 pages, they seem to like slow down the pace. And he was sort of some sort of um, mirror for me, you know, to sort of get my head out of the, the mess and, and breathe a little bit. That, that's how that worked. And it, um, he's one of those guys, uh, he can be very harsh, so you either love it or you just can't stand it. And I personally, I loved it because it was a no, bu no bullshit approach. And, and sometimes you'd be a little bit abrupt about things, and I was like, "Oh, okay, you know, I, I was, you know, my nose was in front of it, and, and I couldn't see it, and, and it made sense." So um, that actually worked out a lot for me because this movie, as you can imagine, was not easy emotionally to write. Um, you know, there were moments when I, I just could not stand watching it. I mean, reading it anymore. It, it was just like too much, too much um, pain and hurt that I had to carry with me. And that, that made it a little bit more healthy. Well, I wish we could go on, but we are out of time. So thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for coming thank tonight. You thank you.